Hey there. All right, I'll get going. Hi, my name's David Buckhurst. I'm uh, one of the heads of engineering at the BBC. I cover the basically the streaming applications that we have, um, but also kind of spearhead the open source movement that we have. So, um, so yeah, let's let's dive straight in. I'm also uh, with my colleague Tom Sadler, who um, will will swap over halfway, but. Essentially, the way we sort of structured this talk is kind of how we work, where I sort of provide the, the air cover for open source and sort of push a lot of the strategy and uh, work with stakeholders and things. And then Tom does all the actual work of uh, you know, trying to get things moving and work with teams and things. So, so we'll, we'll cover some of that. So, but it's, it's worth probably starting with, I guess, just an overview of what the BBC is, because especially outside of the UK, uh, yeah, lots of people have lots of different ideas about what the BBC is, is it a news channel? So I was talking to someone earlier, it was how they learned to speak English. Um, but I mean, there's 21,000 employees. Um, we've got 18,000 of those are public service, so which, which is quite an important distinction for this talk because um, the, the way that we're sort of funded in terms of public service is that it's public money, but there's also like a load of commercial entities that are the BBC worldwide. So uh, but we're, we're not part of that bit. So. Um, yeah, so, but for me, I guess the, 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 the BBC, and my first introduction to the BBC was at school. Um, if anyone knows what this is, it's the, the BBC Micro, yes, which um, was built by Acorn um, in the 80s, and it was part of the BBC's, uh, what was it called, the Computer Literacy Programme, and birthed this sort of whole generation of software developers who uh, wanted to go and work for the BBC eventually. But, um, but, but yeah, sort of seeded the idea in me that, you know, every, Particularly the BBC, but every company is kind of a tech company. So, uh, so, so what do we do? So, Tom and I are from a from a part of the BBC called Product Group. We build essentially the public service um, products for, for UK audiences. So, um, so I guess the big ones, iPlayer in the in the top there, is the streaming platform that, that Tom and I work on. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of mobile applications, probably the. Biggest one, I suppose, news, the news application, that's pretty massive. The um, uh, Sounds is about 5 million users in the UK. Uh, iPlayer is about 25 million users. So, you know, the, these are quite, you know, they're big, they're big sort of audiences. Um, but yeah, kind of UK focused. Um, so yeah, and we also do a lot of kind of educational content. There's a lot of websites for kids. Um, we, we cover a lot of platforms. We've got a massive reach on uh, connected TVs, smart speakers, games consoles, all that kind of thing. So, uh, I guess in terms of our setup, um, we're largely um, largely Linux-based, heavy AWS users, which kind of just works in, in that we're sort of massive adopters of, of open source technology, um, uh, and that's been a, a great enabler for our for our digital products. We don't really buy a lot of services. We do tend to build most things ourselves, which, um, you know, arguably we should buy more, but that's kind of at odds with our sort of desire to be a sort of really high innovation um, uh, group. And, you know, we were one of the earliest adopters of streaming video, um, you know, and we've kind of led the way with smart TV applications, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and, and yeah, so, so from a, some context, I guess, that's helpful for this talk, um, until quite recently, we've, we've been sort of separate business divisions who all build different products and work quite differently with different management and sort of different incentives. So more recently, that's kind of been brought together and it's where we've been looking at things like inner source and, um, we, you know, we, we practice strong ownership, which uh, Tom was talking about yesterday. Um, teams support what they build. It's kind of pure DevOps. Um, and yeah, and, and I guess some other, other points that, that are interesting. So we have a separate R&D division who are kind of like a pure research uh, wing. Uh, we have a huge broadcast engineering organization that we kind of work with, but they sort of have their own, their own thing. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, sort of global websites and applications are built by a sort of commercial subsidiary and third parties. So yeah, to get onto open source then. Um, so BBC has been doing open source for as um, far back as my Google skills allow. Um, so this was this was 2005, the Wayback Machine. Um, I think this this looks like a pretty good website for 2005. I think. Um, 
there's no flashing. Yeah, I, it was a screenshot, sorry. Um, yeah, so, uh, but this, this was kind of my second reminder of the BBC as a tech company. So, um, so I was working as a Perl developer in the, in the 2000s, and, and we realized a whole bunch of the Perl modules that we were using were BBC modules. And so, you know, that kind of got us excited. We went to our management at the time and said, oh, can we, can we release stuff in open source? They went, no, that's not, that's not happening. Absolute no, you're not giving away IP. But, but it did open up my eyes, the idea that there's companies that, that kind of do embrace open source and kind of are part of the ecosystem like that. Uh, so fast forward a number of years, I found myself working for the BBC. Um, this, was, this was the first job I had, which was the open source of, um, of a project called TAL, which is the, um, it's the framework that underpins all our smart TV applications. So, I mean, this is, this is a good 12 years ago now, but, um, but kind of was, was quite a big deal at the time. Um, and then fast forward even further, um, and I, I kind of ended up, you know, moving from open source projects to open source projects at the BBC, uh, and, and then ended up leading what, what was to become a refresh of our, our open source strategy. So, so th this this is kind of the the strategy. It's got it's got three themes that are probably quite familiar to anyone who works in this field. But um, so the idea is Tom and I will use these themes a little bit to talk about. Um, I'll, I'll talk about some of the challenges we have, and some of them are quite specific to to, to being a public service uh, operation, and then Tom can talk about how we uh, how we're tackling some of these things. So uh, yeah, so embrace. So um, so this is yeah consumption of open source basically. So embrace the rich software commons to accelerate product development, keep pace with the industry, and attract and retain talent. So. Um, yeah, I mean, no question, open source has been a massive game changer for the industry, but at the BBC, we've, we've kind of well and truly, you know, everything, everything is uh, open source technology that we use. Um, the, this was a quote I found from 2006, um, which, uh, so if you use the internet, you use open source, and yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely the case. So we embraced it so much that we perhaps went a little bit too far and um, didn't have some of the sort of checks and controls to make sure that what we were doing was, was sensible. So uh, and, we, and we started to get um, questions from senior leaders and things that would go, just a minute, yeah, yeah, what, what about this security risk thing that's, that's in the news? And we, we ended up, there was a, a really expensive migration we had to do as a result of the of a, of a license switch and you know we'd have to take this to finance and they would go well what are you even doing with this open source software so so we we had to kind of um tighten things up a little bit so so this these were a few slides i used when i was trying to make the point to developers that we needed to to yeah think think a bit harder so this this was um it's a representation of a of a repo just plucked at random from our github the pink circle in the middle is um is a BBC repo, and then those are the dependencies in, in blue. So what's that? There's 14 dependencies. So this is a Node project. I'm sure you'll work that out in a minute. But um, and but obviously there's also developer dependencies. Um, you know, and dependencies have dependencies have dependencies have dependencies. And so what? This was just one random repository for a fairly minor service. <laughs> you know, had 339 dependencies that we're you know that we're pulling in without any kind of thought about what we're doing at all. So, I mean, this is absolutely amazing in terms of how much we're getting free from the open source ecosystem, but uh, yeah, it's very scary if you're a lawyer and you consider every single one of those green and blue dots to be some kind of risk that you aren't managing. So, um, and then, yeah, we, we had the whole uh, left pad issue, if anyone remembers that, where one day half of our builds didn't, uh, didn't work. So that, that was a bit of a wake up call. Um, so yeah, so, so rather than going into how we sort of tackle some of this stuff, um, there's a bit of a clue with this service, but um, yeah, we, we've had these kind of increasing concerns and we've, for the first time, we sort of had to defend our usage of, of, of open source, which, which kind of was right, but um, it does, in a good way, it's meant that we've had to apply more rigor and more, um, you know, actually look at what, what we're doing, but I'll leave that to Tom. Um, so, so the second part, which, um, kind of the bit I wanted to talk about more than anything is participate. So this is how you actually engage with open source communities. And this is probably the thing that we found hardest. Um, 
So participate in the rich, evolving open source ecosystem and communities from which we benefit. Be a voice in the direction of our industry through open source leadership and exemplary engagement. Um, there's, there's this kind of dramatic quote as well that um, has been uh, flying around for a few years. But, um, but yeah, I think the sort of point about, you know, you need to be part of those communities and part of the discussion if you don't want surprises. Um, especially if you want to avoid a really costly migration project. So again, looking at the looking at that random uh, module. So so what I did was pull out all of the contributors for for each of these each of these repos. So so we had 18 internal developers over a couple of years have been working on this, and then each each of those nodes has some some number of collaborators. So 116 collaborate, collaborators across 26 communities just for sort of those core dependencies. But yeah, as you know, dependencies of dependencies of dependencies, communities are depending on communities, 18 internal collaborators, 335 total dependencies, 7,106 total external collaborators. So, so, so basically for, for every, uh, every developer you have working for you, there's, there's 400 other developers who are also writing your code. So, um, 0.25% of the developers who build your products actually actually work for you. So if you're not part of those communities, yeah, your your business is definitely at risk. So um, so why why don't we just collaborate with all of those projects? Like we really struggle to um, you know, we'll have a patch and we just keep it in a fork and it just sits there forever. Uh, you know, and in fact we spend a load of effort trying to keep things up to date and um, but but it just you know it's not been that simple. Um, part of it is our sort of open source policy, which which was a sort of very permissive one that allowed us to use whatever we wanted and even open source anything we wanted. It kind of didn't have much to say about communities and how we support that. So so we, yeah, we've we've really been tackling that. But um, you know from a from a legal perspective, the way that they're thinking about it is you know every single every single. Um, you know, module you bring in, that's a that's a business relationship with some entity that you need to, you know, they, they want to go and have a terms and conditions discussion. And if that's, uh, yeah, um, 400 uh, dependencies that they've got to have specific terms and conditions for, it's never going to happen. So, um, but yeah, there's so many different types of communities, like there isn't just a one size fits all uh, approach, you know, there's foundations, large companies, there's other companies and partners that we that we work with. There's uh, you know all the non-commercial entities, distributed communities, and enthusiasts and individuals who just slap a license on a thing and forget about it. And you know, so so yeah, all of those kind of need a slightly different approach. And then we've got all the different types of licenses, all the interpretations of those licenses, the CLAs, the patent concerns and, and you know we we didn't even manage to get past the point where we could agree on what a contribution was so yeah that this this stuff yeah it, it is is quite tricky um but i think that the big one really is 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 the thing about public money in that with with public money you need to be really conscious about where it is that you're spending that so what projects are you supporting that says something right so um you know even if it's just about some developer time to go on do a patch or something like that. That's that's public money that we're consciously spending on on a project, and we have to, you know, we, we need sort of controls around uh, and frameworks to make decisions around that. Um, and, and then, yeah, f final part of the strategy. So create. So ironically, this bit we found really easy. We 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 could kind of release what we wanted as long as there was, you know, some senior business leader who'd go, oh yeah, whatever. Um, so um, establish our own open source portfolio, lead the industry, benefit from our own communities. So, so we, we've actually got an absolute ton of open source software that we've released over the years. This is the, this is the website. I think it's only 99 projects and counting because uh, we just ran out of time to count them all. But, um, but yeah, th I mean, this is a web website essentially we've had for years. This was sort of the latest iteration. Um, but yeah, the, the, the I guess yeah, this is something that other companies we've talked to have really found hard, but um, but we've sort of gone with it, and there's a number of reasons why why we do it. So, um, st uh, so yeah, number one, strategic. So um, so Tal that I mentioned earlier is a really good example of a of a sort of strategic initiative where we'd open a, a project. So um, so Tal, you know, it was a 
essentially a shared framework for building TV apps that meant we could you know, build more, more and more TV apps faster. But it, it wasn't just a convenience for us. The, the whole idea of it was to really drive a standards-based approach uh, you know, in an industry that uh, to, to date, we'd, you know, we'd have to build eight different TV apps for all the different platforms. And, and we, we just sort of said, well, that's enough is enough, really. Um, so, so trying to drive a web-based uh, standards approach for, for TV apps, which which has been really successful. I mean, we've only we've only got one TV code base now, whereas you know, once upon a time, I think it, it got as high as fourteen. Um, so, um, but but yeah, one of the things there though was we had to go to our regulators to go. We're going to do something that's disruptive with open source. You know, we, you know, it, it you know it's gonna it's gonna change the way that people build TV apps, it's going to have an impact on companies that, you know, provide consultancy for how you build TV apps. So, so we had to go through a fairly lengthy process with regulators to actually get them to agree that there was sort of public benefit in, in, in spending money on that. Uh, so R&D, I mentioned our research department. So they're probably our most active open source participants. Um, so they license a lot of what they do under open source. Like if they have a project that doesn't go anywhere, they'll, you know, to finish off that project, they'll often just release all the code so that it's there for reference. Um, but they also partner with a lot of third parties. Um, best to look at the website for that one. But yeah, there's, there's lots of cool stuff there. Um, recruitment retention. So, um, so our engineers want to release open source code. So we, you know, we absolutely encourage them to do that. Um, and we do have teams that, that just develop in the open, and we found that's been a, a really good practice for just you know having having something that uh, you know you don't have to think about. You've got teams that really um, kind of buy into it and understand how to support it. Uh, this was this was us at Fostem a few years back when we were promoting some of the test tooling that we were involved in. Um, public remit, so um, things like. BBC Alley, which is our accessibility standards checker. So we've got automation tools around around checking accessibility. The standards are published, and um, you know that that's that's been uh, yeah another one. Um, Microbit, if if you came across that, was sort of like a, a a modern version of the BBC Micro, but that was that was um, yeah essentially a tiny computer we sent out to schools. We, we released the, the hardware designs open source um, and spun that out as a, a non-profit in 2016. Um, but, but yeah, this is, this is the really big one, I think. From, oh, oh, yeah, contributing back. I got to, uh, so yeah, contributing back, I, I think because we've struggled to uh, contribute to projects that are already out there, we've, we've found that we sort of over-indexed on adding extra projects to those ecosystems so which which has been fine but i think in a, in a lot of places that you know we, we've kind of gone you know what it would have been better if we'd just been part of that that project so um but yeah we do absolutely believe that contributing backs uh, super super important um and, and and this one's the one that was sort of surprising but it's probably the most important for us which um we found that when you open source stuff, it's actually the, the best way of facilitating internal collaboration. So, um, you know, GEL is our um, design system. Um, essentially, that's a reference everyone knows and understands, and it's built with principles of open source in mind, but it's, it's only really kind of useful to our, to our internal teams. Um, but there's lots of projects like that where we've just gone, right, hey, we might as well open this, open this up, um, you know, because it's something that sort of universally uh, applicable to all of our teams, but then also becomes quite a good open source project. Um, we also developed something called the Open Development Framework, which um, turned out to just be a lot like inner source and kind of joined up with them at, at some point. But, um, but yeah. Um, so to conclude on the create bit, um, and, and why not just simply open source everything? Um, well, open source we've discovered has has a cost so i mean there's the short term of just preparing your code and doing the licensing and due diligence and getting legal involved but the long-term support and ownership of a, of a project something that um you know we've we've had some success with and we've had other projects where you know the the team left or a reorg meant that it was kind of no longer owned and we ended up you know open source isn't just for christmas and ended up with like business priorities changing and found that 
projects that built a community around them were kind of no longer supported. So, um, so yeah, being really deliberate around what kind of portfolio of open source we actually have. Um, th there's also the thing is like uh, looking through a lot of our code, a lot of it's just glue, has no intrinsic value. There's a lot of config, a lot of tests that, um, yeah, we, we probably wouldn't open up really. Um, but there's a big one around business stakeholders who just kind of don't get it. Um, so, you know, surely it's a security risk. Um, what, we're giving away IP, that's sort of the, the other concern. Uh, but mainly the, well, why aren't you just building more features? This does feel like a distraction from providing direct user value. So, um, you know, we, we kind of have to work work with that. But but also like, the as I mentioned, the public money market disruption thing, like every time we, we want to open source a project, we have to go through a process of, you know, checking what the market impact would be, like are there companies that will be disrupted as a result of that, um, which, you know, might be fine, um, but then we have to go through various kind of public interest tests. So uh, that is my bit. So I'll hand over to Tom who can talk about how, how we've been tackling some of this. Great, thanks David. Um, so yeah, so I guess this is OspoCon, um, and we don't uh, we don't have kind of a, a fully staffed OSPO or anything like that, but we have found ourselves gradually forming a, a virtual OSPO, you could think of it, um, and this is kind of made up of just the one full-time engineering role, which is me. Um, we have some dedicated uh, intellectual property rights support from our uh, content rights and uh, business affairs division. Um, so it's great that I've now got that contact and, uh, and have a go-to person. Um, but a lot of it, uh, a lot of this virtual OSPO comes down to uh, communities, uh, people using their 10% time, um, and just a network of advocates who believe in open source and are pushing it locally wherever they're working in the BBC. And uh, David talked about like air cover and ground cover. Um, this is a metaphor uh, we first came across in uh, in the inner source commons and how to enable inner source programs. Um, but I think it applies for, for this as well. Um, so essentially your air cover is your uh, your senior management who are actually like making budget available. Like my role wouldn't exist without David advocating for it. Um, but also uh, defining it in the strategy, kind of speaking at all hands so people get this kind of um, that the open source matters and we need to be engaging with it. Um, and then the ground cover is, yeah, the, the advocates on the ground. So um, your engineers who are like up for contributing and, and trying to get contributions in or want to get their code open sourced, first and second line managers actually supporting it and encouraging it. Um, I'll talk about some specific examples later on. Uh, and then, yeah, specialised roles um, like myself and our um, intellectual property rights specialist. So in terms of what my role actually is, um, so my job title is principal software engineer, um, and it's kind of a staff plus role. Uh, it's the whole kind of staff plus track, that kind of individual <coughs> contributor track is quite uh, quite interesting, but also quite daunting. Like I've got a lot of I've got a lot of freedom, which is a great privilege, but it's also like, how do you figure out how to add value? Um, you have so many different opportunities, but I thought I'd just mention uh, Staff Plus as a kind of discipline. Um, if anyone's in that kind of role, uh, there is kind of so, you know, communities out there in the industry um, exploring what it means to be Staff Plus, because it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting trying to figure out where best to focus your time, how to influence without having sort of direct reports or anything like that. Um, so I'm incubated in one particular business unit, the, the TV apps, and the idea is that we'll try and uh, prove out some of this stuff in, in the TV app space and eventually uh, or gradually work across the wider BBC. And yeah, uh, a big part of my role has been starting to understand intellectual property considerations. So like 18 months ago, I don't think I really understood like the difference between copyright and patenting. Um, and like, you know, uh, just to throw, throw a, a buzzword out there, AI, like, you know, um, AI completely changes um, or massively increases the, the challenges of being compliant. So trying to understand that, attending events like this, um, and yeah, being that bridge between 
understanding enough about intellectual property, like I'm definitely not a lawyer, but um, understanding more than your average engineer at least, but still have an engineering background. And yeah, um, working, with our, working with our IPR specialist, um, understanding how to bridge that gap, how to, how to speak to him, um, and kind of what, what his motivations are, um, how he thinks, so that we can actually have those, those conversations and come to a, a good balance of um, protecting our intellectual property and being compliant, but also like streamlining and actually enabling us to open source and, and contribute upstream. Um, so yeah, um, so actually th this is one area where it is gone beyond TV, which is great. Um, so we don't have we don't have loads, but sort of uh, a little over a year ago, we started in one particular area uh, in TV, um, and we're we're just about working towards a process now um, that's getting more and more streamlined, where we can, if somebody wants to contribute to an upstream project, we know the process we need to go through. We know the questions that our IPR guy is going to ask. Um, and yeah, it's getting quicker and quicker. It's going from like, it was months to get sign off and now it's down to weeks. Hopefully it'll be down to days. Um, and then yeah, I guess uh, supporting TV teams to deliver open source. This one actually not made so much progress on. Um, like David was talking about TAL, so historically we've done quite a good job here. Um, but actually as we've moved away from TAL, um, so actually one big, one big thing since I've taken on this role is deprecating TAL and actually being transparent about the fact that we don't really support it anymore because um, we, we did kind of drop the ball a bit in terms of um, supporting TAL users um, but there's still still an interesting community of TV developers that we're starting to, to engage with uh, not in terms of sharing code but sharing knowledge and I'll talk a little bit more about that later um, and yeah industry engagement so doing this talk for instance um, but also you know learning from communities like to do um, you know, open chain, chaos, um, and I guess the one that I've personally been most involved with is the inner source commons. Um, so when I was developing the TV apps, um, I did a lot of work on inner source, and um, yeah, I, I kind of continued my uh, continued my contributions to the inner source commons, um, and you know, being given the freedom in my day job to spend some time like contributing to this community, um, and it's been because the open source commons works in the open source way it's really helped me understand like how how open source communities work by being more involved but also how non-profit foundations work so it's given me all that industry context that i can then take back to to people in the bbc and help them understand how how open source works and then in terms of the kind of uh, grassroots side of things the people who who have day jobs and but do care about open source um, so we have a kind of community of practice around open source. This is essentially just a Slack channel where we share stories, share information. Um, but that um, that kind of network, that ability to just have you know a thousand people in a Slack channel sharing what they're doing in open source means that um, there's that information getting spread around. Um, but also, like I'm advertising my services to enable upstream contributions and things like that. Then we have a guild, which so um, we kind of have like yeah. So the community of practice is all about just knowledge essentially and making connections. And then the guild, um, so we're in the guild. We have some ten percent time available, and we're trying to build like a body of knowledge uh, and references for people to go to when they want to learn more about whether it's yeah consuming, contributing, or creating their own. And then the network of advocates, so. If, if you don't have sort of team leads and, and engineers on the ground and product managers engaged, then that's going to stifle open source. Like, you know, me and David can go around telling everyone how amazing open source is and say, look, we can contribute. But if the people on the ground aren't, aren't bought in and aren't bothered about contributing, then it's, even though we're enabling it, it's not, it's not going to happen. But having that, advocate, that network of advocates is, is really essential. Uh, and yeah, um, our, our explorations within a source have, have been helpful as well. Um, so, like, as David was saying, we, we realised that our we were getting internal collaboration through having open source projects. So we went, oh, all this stuff that the business isn't comfortable open sourcing, well, let's just do like an internal open source thing. Realised it was in a source, um, and that uh, that was kind of the 
our journey from open source to inner source, but then as we've been doing more inner source, that is teaching developers how to interact with people, async, pull requests, all the stuff that I think probably most of the people in this room are probably quite familiar with, but a lot of developers, it's, it's brand new to them. So we've got this open source, teaches you how to do inner source, but then inner source actually trains up the next generation of, of open source practitioners. Um, yeah, but enables more open source. Like you don't need to do inner source to do open source, but the idea is it, it enables you to do more. So yeah, um, coming back to the kind of three point strategy that David was talking about, um, embrace, yeah, we build all of our stuff on open source. Um, and in terms of responsibility for, for compliance and security, uh, does often come down to the local leadership. So your, your team lead, your engineering manager, um, we do have a central infosec team, which are actually pretty proactive in like the you know the communities of practice and things, um, and you know we have processes like threat modelling, um, which to be honest probably should consider open source dependencies a bit more, um, but yeah, the kind of security compliance is generally pushed down into the into the teams themselves, and in terms of security compliance, probably apart from threat modelling, just Dependabot is the main way that we're doing that. So we could definitely do more in this space, you know, better source code analysis or software composition analysis. Um, but uh, for now, at least at least we have some level of saying, are my dependencies up to date? Are there known vulnerabilities in my dependencies? And then, yeah, David talked about the uh, re uh, uh, repo risk tracker. Um, so this is built on a GitHub webhook. Um, so every time, uh, well, I think it is opt-in. Um, I don't think we've actually got the webhook on at the org level. I think projects uh, or BBC repos do need to opt into this by applying the webhook. But then um, every time every time a commit gets committed, then um, the repo risk tracker scans the dependencies uh, for potential license problems. Um, and whether by design or not, um, it it will look at the latest version of the dependency as well. So this really usefully alerted us to a license change uh, on a particular dependency that we had. So at first it was like, oh, uh, red alert for a, a potential compliance issue. But then we looked into it and went, ah, it's a license change. So but at least we know about it now and we can deal with that. And then the other side of uh, consuming open source in a more, you know, with a bit more due diligence, um, we've been uh, we've been providing teams with kind of frameworks and questions to ask to help them understand like is this open source project uh, is this open source library appropriate like is it going to be maintained long term um, so yeah understanding who it's backed by you know we we've heard a lot at this conference about like uh, bait and switch and things like that so understanding what the motivations of of the um, of the provider of the open source library is, you know, is it community based, is it foundation based, is it corporate based? And um, another side of it is understanding the community health. So uh, using like, chaos metrics, we can have a look at like, is this, um, is this well maintained? Is there single points of failure? Um, and the, the three metrics that we pulled out um, for, for, for Preact in this example, uh, that's fairly basic. Uh, Chaos have actually done some more work in their metrics model working group uh, over the past year or so. I think it's the project viability metrics, um, if you want to check that out. Um, really useful to understand uh, if, if your dependencies are, are well supported. And then uh, the other sorts of questions we need to ask are licensing, um, you know, what, what's the direction of the project on a technical level as well, especially in like TV apps, like, is this is this dependency going to start using really fancy cutting-edge JavaScript features that TVs don't support? Uh, so yeah, there's the, there's the community aspect, there's the security, maintenance, license compliance, but also technically, is this a good, um, is this a good dependency to take? Is this, a, is this suitable? So providing all this stuff, as I say, uh, there's no centralized responsibility for this, um, but we're, we're providing the tools for the, for the local engineering leadership to make better decisions in this area. And then, yeah, participate. Um, as I say, things like doing this, uh, working with the Unisource Commons and that. Um, we, 
we do have BBC Tech Meetups. So again, this is, this is via a community of people using their 10% time to organize meetups. And uh, one thing that we've done quite well here is um, starting to get collaboration with other TV developers. So we've had a few TV developer meetups. Again, sharing knowledge, not code, but it's still that industry engagement side of things. So yeah, contributing upstream, as I say, we are getting there now. We are able to do it and this process is getting more streamlined. And now we understand that if we understand the value of contributing upstream, we understand what the license and the CLA problems are, get senior manager sign off, get legal sign off, then we're most of the way there. Uh, and then in terms of what we've agreed with our IPR specialist, um, having some nominated senior engineers uh, who can make sure that contributions are suitable and following contribution guidelines, uh, raise the alarm if there are any IP rights that we need to consider, and then just keeping a record um, is something that, that um, the, the IP specialists want us to do. And yeah, we, we were finally able to do it. We started in the media playback space, as I was saying, and now this process has been rolled out um, to, uh, to a few more teams. Um, so yeah, only a handful of projects so far, only a handful of pull requests, but it's, it's a good start and it should, should accelerate from here. And then the create side, yeah, we have a lot of open source repositories. Um, how many of these are kind of uh, watched in terms of pull requests? You know, is there someone on the other end kind of keeping an eye out for pull requests and issues? We're not sure. So uh, the, the guild is trying to provide a maturity model to help help people who want to make sure their open source is supported properly, have the, the knowledge and the tools in place. And um, so actually this is, this is a more recent screenshot. <laughs> so it's gone down because we've actually identified some deprecated ones. Again, like it, it looks like we're doing less open source, which is bad, but actually being a bit more transparent about what we're supporting is, I think, better. And then the TV space, uh, Tal's deprecated. We have a couple of TV-specific libraries, uh, which are, um, I think, I think Elrod especially is uh, quite interesting in terms of doing um, up, down, left, right navigation on a on a TV app, which is obviously not how you'd use a website or a mobile uh, or a website on a uh, on a mobile or a tablet. Uh, Big Screen Player is can end up being a little bit too BBC specific, but it's still pretty good that we can share that with with partners. So I'm rushing a bit at the end because I'm aware of time, um, but we've not done as much. Uh, we've not done as much open source in uh, in TV as I think we would like. We've not kind of fully replaced Tal. We've only partially replaced Tal. Um, and yeah, priorities. Um, prior it's it's always it's always a challenge to say like yes, people value open source, but do they value it as much as delivering product features? Um, so we've, we've got the buy-in on paper, but it kind of gets bumped quite a bit with, uh, with other priorities. And um, I don't have time to go into this in detail, but we, ha we have an interesting challenge specifically with the monorepo, where we have a, a combination of open source candidate code and stuff that can't really be open sourced. So there's a, there's a piece of technical work that needs to be done to have a mirroring service. Um, so we think we're going to use um, this tool called Copybara. It's a Google open source tool. We think we're going to use that to mirror a subsection of our TV monorepo um, to have to have that kind of all the benefits of mon all the benefits of the monorepo for when we're working together, um, but then we're still able to open source our code. So I'll quickly hand over to David for the last bit. Yeah, so what's next? Well, we didn't even put the picture in. We wrote this last night. So, um, so exploring, um, yeah, so w what's next, I guess? Yeah, exploring a more formal OSPO model. So this is, this is something we, we keep arguing about whether we like our grassroots approach and we feel like we might lose something if we went formal, but there's also other things we can gain. So we're trying to see how we balance that um, and maybe how we could have the best of both. Um, Automate and streamline the contribution process. So, yeah, I mean that that's that's really going well in that we we now have you know quite a sort of catalogue of projects that that engineers can can just contribute to, you know, without really any any um, you know massive massive constraint. Um, contribute what we've learnt to industry communities like this one. So so yeah, I think there's some interesting things around frameworks around deciding on open source projects, particularly as a, as a sort of public service funded operation that I think, you know, could, could have value. 
um, and yeah, contribute more. That's uh, that's that's really the goal. All right. Thank you. Got a question? Do we have a mic for the room? <coughs> do we have a mic for the room? Do you want to shout? And I can oh, repeat it. Um, to what extent do you collaborate with other broadcasters or with other large content providers? And particularly at the infrastructure level, what, what goes on there? Yeah, so the question was to what extent we contribute with other, other broadcasters. So, um, yeah, I can't speak massively for the, for the infrastructure layer. I know there is a lot of kind of standards-based sharing there more, more than anything else. We are part of the EBU, um, what's it called, the, the own platforms group. So particularly things like the challenges of building TV apps, things around prominence on, on um, you know, on... TV homepages and all of that kind of thing, we, we share a lot uh, with, with the industry there. We do have specific kind of partners, like for example, as a CMS, we work with The Guardian. Well, it's their CMS, but we're kind of a, a big partner in that. Um, you know, uh, R&D in particular, a lot of what they do is, is with partnerships. Um, yeah, um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely going to be more of that as well. I think the, particularly the EBU relationship seems to be, uh, seems to be growing. You want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, coming back to the um, metric that you have of the number of repositories and open source that you are hosting uh, or um, having in, in, uh, in between the software developers, um, how do you leverage the quality versus quantity question and how do you uh, tackle this challenge of maybe focusing developers on less amount of repos but a little better quality on them rather than just pushing as much repos as they can. Yeah, so the, so the question is, it's, yeah, quality versus quantity. How do you focus developers to make sure they're, you know, maybe fewer, better repositories that are shared? Do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, so I think that that is something we need to be better at. Um, so if we did have a fully resourced OSPO, we could look at the metrics and, and kind of have some monitoring around that. Um, but um, Currently, it's just a case of reaching out to as many different software engineering teams as we can, um, and showing them like this is how this is this is how you kind of uh, mindfully contribute and, and mindfully open source things. Um, so it's so yeah, there are definitely opportunities to do this better with some automation tools, but for now, it's just that knowledge sharing piece and saying this is how you do it and also this is the business value so like the the media playback side of things like having that media playbacks having those media playback specialists really zero in on here are some really interesting things in our domain in our area of expertise saying well these are the valuable things to, to contribute to but also to open source and then yeah advocating ad advocating for deprecation where things have been abandoned I mean, one, one of the advantages is I do get to approve all the open source projects. So quite often someone will go, oh, well, we want to open. They'll be like, yeah, we've already got one of them. Yeah. Use, use that one. <laughs> it's been quite a good discovery mechanism. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, what about the contribution you get on your code? I mean, do you release a code once, once it's up and running? Or are you just saying the user stories are this? And with my contribution for all over the world in order to reach this feature to work. Yeah, so, so the question's about, yeah, on contribution and kind of do we invite it or, I think, I mean, it's it's really a sort of case by case uh, basis. We did talk about putting badges at one point on on repos to sort of go, yeah, this is one that we'd like, uh, we'd like input. Um, I mean, I think things like TAL, um, contributions came from a lot of, um, from partners, from, uh, you know, TV manufacturers who wanted to, you know, here's a better way of doing, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, we, we've got other things like uh, so Simorg is the is the um, it's it's the BBC.com global website which which is kind of more there as a sort of this is how we how we do it it's working in the open I, I mean it has had a few pull requests but it's not one it's more there for sort of reference than anything else um, and, and you know a lot of the R and D projects are kind of they're completed projects from our perspective so they're there you can take and expand but but yeah. 
So the question is, do we have any open source content? Don't know. Don't think so. The, the, once upon a time, we did. I, there was a, there was a there was a big move for sort of opening up all of our APIs and data and things like that. But it it sort of I think at the last charter kind of was was sort of written out. So I, yeah, it, it didn't seem to go anywhere. So, do you need a TV license to download code? I can guarantee you don't. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, yeah, I guess what from feedback to the Linux, Linux Foundation, what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? I mean, the the thing we've benefited from massively is is the communities like like this, like to do um, open, chain. open chain in particular have been you know we've we've worked with them for a number of years. They've been not that we're massive contributors to that project, but it's been really useful getting the insight there. Um, I guess the, the the there is a question around like as an industry, how could we make it easier for companies to contribute upstream? Like, it, it really does feel like you're having to solve the problem again and again for all these different foundations and companies and licenses. And yeah, there, there, there must be some more standard templates and uh, processes. I, I think that's something actually Open Chain are starting to look at, isn't it? Yeah, because I think, uh, I, I suppose anyone more involved in Open Chain can correct me, but I believe there's already the security standard and the compliance standard. And yeah, I believe that Open Chain are now working on a, a upstream contribution standard. Um, so actually, that's probably a good thing we could contribute to mm -hmm. based on what we've, what we've learned. All right. I think we're there then. Thank yeah. you.